This program is made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, by the financial support of viewers like you. The Markle Foundation. The Schumann Foundation. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies supplying health care products worldwide. by my parents that lying was wrong. I found out that my father's lied to me. It was a lie that I believed about myself, to myself, inside myself. The fellow claimed he had eight million in sales and he had two, very simple. I lied to vendors, they lied to me. I guess it was a game, we did it to each other. Deception in every game, everybody lies a little, even I. Uh... Once I broke a window, and then I was I kind of thinking of lies, but I decided to tell the truth. When I feel that the person is deliberately lying, it hurts. What is the cost, the most fundamental cost of lying? It's the loss of trust. Nobody has the formula for how you reestablish trust. Every lie in the public mind needs a willing listener, needs a listener or listeners who want to believe it's true. 54,000 Americans died, count millions of Vietnamese died, really for a deception. A belief is simply a self-confirming theory. If you have a belief, what happens is you ignore any evidence that disputes it, and you remember and you exaggerate everything that supports it. And lift on liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission. There was not one engineer in that room the night before the launch that supported the decision to launch. Not one. I'm Bill Moyers. In this broadcast, we'll look at how deception has influenced some of the major events of our recent past and how self-deception shapes our personal lives and the public mind. My colleagues and I have been examining the reasons why trusted people in public life lie to us and to themselves, and why America seems to take such deception for granted. Have the lies become so many that the public mind has been saturated and numb by them? Or have we actually become addicted to deception? We're still healing as a nation from the lies of Vietnam and Watergate. But Ronald Reagan left office the most popular president in years, even though most Americans believed he lied about the Iran-Contra scandal. Oliver North admitted he lied to Congress, and he became a hero to millions. Something's going on here. Public lies diminish your power and mine as free men and women to make informed choices. But like a family in denial over a loved one's addiction, America often refuses to face the painful truth about itself. Why is this so, and can a nation die of too many lies? At one time or another, most of us have deceived someone else, a friend, colleague, or a loved one. Petty deceptions are part of the fabric of everyday life. Now, psychologists tell us that lies at home and lies in the Oval Office have some things in common. Their roots run to childhood. Magic trick. Here's a card with some spots on it. Four spots on this side. Now on the other side of the card, there's three spots. On this side, there's six. And on this side, there's only one. Now, only a few of you know how to do it. I'll tell everybody how to do this trick. You promise you won't tell anybody I showed you? Yeah! Crucial to the definition of lying is did I give you prior notification? Did I tell you whether or not I intend to mislead you? A magician, by his costume and manner, notifies you they're going to trick you. An actor is notifying you, an imposter is not. Notification is crucial. Psychologist Paul Ekman, author of the books Telling Lies and Why Kids Lie, is one of America's foremost authorities on deception. What technique do you use, whether I mislead you by concealing information or I mislead you by giving you false information, it's just a matter of tactics. They're both lies. If my son, uh, who's almost 17, were to uh, get into a lot of trouble in school, 
and the principal were to call him, uh, called him in and said, you know, if you insult your teacher again, you're out of school. And he comes home, and over dinner, we're chatting, and he says nothing about it. He's lying to me. I don't need to ask him every night, did you get in trouble at school today? Most people would say, if I asked him that question and he said no, that would be a lie. But the fact that he didn't tell me wouldn't be a lie. That, I believe, is wrong. He's misleading me. He knows that in our family, as in most families, if you get into a lot of trouble at school, you're supposed to tell your parents about it. They don't have to ask you every day about it. So concealing, withholding information is lying. That's just as much a lie. It's just a matter of tactics. Now, everybody would prefer to lie by concealing. It's easier on your memory. And you can always claim you're going to tell the person later. So you've got a way out. Are there any similarities between personal lying and political lying? The amazing thing is the comparability. I mean, why people lie for very often the same reasons. If you look at children, you look at adults, you look at politicians, we don't want to get punished. What is the worst lie you ever told? Oh. Candace. I have th no, four boys that live down the street. Oh, I know about them. And um, one, I said, I will give you the most calm ride I have ever given anyone in the world in my little wagon. And I start to pull him, and um, a car's coming, and we leave him in the middle of the street. The car just slams his brakes, and he's in the middle, and um, is, um, the mom comes out, and she says, Jai, why are you out in the street? And he says, um, oh, th those girls pushed me. And I and we said that we didn't. We said we 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 didn't. We just we just didn't do that. We're just lying. Uh huh. So why didn't you tell the truth? Well, because I would have gotten in serious trouble. Oh. Young children can be very harsh critics about lying. They will never see a situation in which lying is acceptable. And yet, if you push them a bit, um, they will grant that there are occasions, and those are occasions where life itself seems to be at stake, where it's more important to lie than to tell the truth. What do you think you should do if you are home, yes. all alone, and somebody comes to the door and rings the doorbell, and you look through, you have one of these little things, you look through the window and you see it's a real mean-looking person, and he says, I need to come into your house to use a telephone. No, okay. no, no, no. And I'd give if you said to them, I'm sorry you can't come in because my parents are home and asleep, okay, and I don't want you to wake them, would that be a lie? Yeah. Yes. No. yes, it would well, still be a lie, lie but it would be a lie for safety. It'd be a, it'd it'd be a lie, lies. but it'd be a good safety lie. Safety lie. I want you to know lying does not come easy to me. I want you to know that it doesn't come easy to anybody. But I think we all had to weigh in the balance the difference between lives and lies. I had to do that on a number of occasions in both these operations. And it is not an easy thing to do. It's such a fantastic little vignette. I mean, there's so many issues densely packed. Philosophers for centuries have argued about, is there ever a condition under which it's proper, it's moral to lie? And those who say there is, give the example of the man who comes bursting into your house, says, I'm going to kill your brother. Where is he? And he's actually in the next room. Do you say, he's not here? Do you say, I don't know? Or do you say, he's sitting in the next room, and he goes in and kills him? What's the moral act? Okay. That's, what, that's what Ollie is citing. Ollie is citing that it's improper to lie. It doesn't come easy. It's distasteful. He's the object of his own disgust, but if a life is at stake, then it's proper. Okay? Now, I believe that's, that view is widely shared, and I actually believe in it also. The issue is, were lives at stake? That's a political judgment. Now, the second issue is, who are you lying to? Because what he's, who he's lying to are people who are given the responsibility to form that political judgment to Congress. It's a special type. Of, it's not lying to the murderer. Nobody's going to say you shouldn't lie to the murderer. He's lying to Congress. What he's basically saying, in a, in a rather diplomatic and beautifully done way, in terms of how he presents himself, is that Congress is the murderer. 
Congress is murdering these Contras by withdrawing the aid, and the only way I can save their lives is to lie to Congress. The good lie, the just lie. As citizens, we hear it from leaders. As children, we heard it from parents. When should we protect each other from the truth? We ask some Americans about deception in family life. I wouldn't lie to my kid, regardless of what he would ask me, because I, that sets up, I think, bad precedents. It's, and it sets the kid up, because eventually the kid's going to grow up and maybe find out that he, was being, he or she was being lied to all along. And uh, you, you, I, I was starting to lose more later on by lying to my child now. So regardless of what he asked me, I will tell him the truth. Well, first of all, I told each one that he or she was my favorite. And they all got together <laughs> and uh, discovered that that was a big lie, you know. What do you mean I'm your favorite? You told. But um, I've also lied as a parent would to reassure them. For example, my husband was ill and my children were very worried about him. And I did consciously pretend to them that I was far more optimistic and far less frightened than I actually was. I wouldn't do that today. A lot of things happened to, I think, protect me as a child that were lies, but they were used to protect me against finding out certain things about other family members or about myself or whatever. And the problem with that was once I found the truth about what was going on, it really has affected my life. And I think that's where a lot of family lies come from, is the, the liars feel like this person can't take it. They just won't be able to deal with it. The fear is that if I speak the truth, A, everyone will hate me, I won't be loved anymore, and B, the family is going to dissolve. It will shatter our reality, our shared reality. Dr. Dan Goldman is a psychologist and the author of Vital Lies, Simple Truths. What is a, a vital lie? A vital lie is a story that we concoct to protect ourselves from a painful truth, essentially. And it might be uh, a truth about something embarrassing we've done or something we're ashamed of, something that makes us anxious. It might be um, a story that uh, a family lives by in order to uh, keep a sense of security, uh, a sense that uh, people are safe in the family. It's a lie we need in order to live. Need? For need, what purpose? Need to, uh, to keep ourselves from being overcome by anxiety, fear, rage, whatever feeling it is that we're protecting ourselves. Because in that truth lies something that is so disturbing that we'd rather not face it and live a half-truth than face it and feel the pain. And that, for me, was the original lie. How I learned to give part of myself away to keep my father comfortable. Families can confront their vital lie. With the support and compassion of others, we are allowed to speak the truth without rebuke. Oh, God, it was tough. It was tough to say that I resented my daughter and even hated her for a while because of all the pain. In therapy, the courage to finally speak the truth is a struggle to acknowledge reality. A family, an alcoholic family, for instance, doesn't want to face the painful truth, so it looks away at the key facts, and it will inflate things that make them, people feel, well, we're really a happy, normal family here. Why? What's at work here? What's at work is one of the most primitive needs that we all have, and that is the need to feel that we belong to a secure, family, that we have a place in the world, that we have a home, that we have people who love us, who will care for us. And that need is so basic that we'll do everything to protect that sense of belonging. Including lie. Including lie. And you see, along with that goes the fear that if we speak the truth, the family will be destroyed. It'll shatter the group. And yet I know there are some things that are so painful to face. And I know I couldn't have had a recovery without facing them. And one of them was the myth. One of them was the myth about family. I had a myth that I came from a close family, and I didn't. I had a myth that my daughter and I were close, and we weren't. 
I was jetting around trying to save the world, and where was my daughter? She's wondering where the hell her mother was, is what she was doing. That was a very painful myth to break, because it was a myth that I built up over years and years and years from my childhood. It was a lie that I learned to tell myself so well, it was so deeply embedded from the babyhood. It's all I knew, and I really believed it. It wasn't like a lie. I didn't feel like a lie, because I believed it was part of me. It was a myth so deep. It was a lie that I believed about myself, to myself, inside myself. Not like the kind of lie we tell to somebody else. That's trivial compared to the in these ones. Self-deception is motivated by self-protection. The reason that we look away is to protect ourselves from the thing we fear the most. You talk about blind spots in connection with vital lies. What do you mean by blind spots? It's anything in your reality, in your immediate reality, your emotional world, that you can't bear to see, that you look away from, that you don't notice and don't notice that you don't notice. Such as your father's alcoholism, your mother's stupor. Exactly, or, yeah, or the beatings you had as a child. You say, oh, well, my parents were very good disciplinarians. You don't realize I was an abused child. So this kind of deception requires collusion. Anytime you have a shared lie, a vital lie in a group, it survives because everyone is playing the game. It, it, you know, a lie needs both someone who speaks it and someone who's willing to believe it. The listener is part of the lie. The same with uh, any collective, you know, the, the National Security Council, the, the meeting of the top advisors to the president are as susceptible to those forces as an alcoholic family. In some ways, even more susceptible. Because if you're in a privileged decision-making group, a powerful decision-making group, my God, that's a group you want to belong to. It's a very special group. Are you saying that the need to belong to the group is more important than being an individual of integrity? You don't want to be the one who brings up the unpopular truth. You want to be the one who can do it, who can make it real, who can make our belief be the truth. You describe very vividly this group think at work in the Bay of Pigs episode, 1962. Most stunning example is uh, the invasion of the Bay of Pigs because Kennedy and his top security advisors met daily for close to two or three months before to plan the Bay of Pigs invasion. The plan was that a group of Cubans trained by the U.S., by the CIA, in, in Guatemala, in fact, would uh, invade Cuba and that their invasion would trigger a popular uprising and that Castro would be swept out, would be overwhelmed. This plan was discussed by the best and the brightest of the Kennedy years. The top people, they were all there in that room. In that room, People knew things such as the invading force was outnumbered 140 to 1, that a CIA secret survey in Cuba had shown that the Cuban people would not rise up to support the invading force, which was the operative premise of the whole operation. Even though those two facts were known, in all those meetings, they were never spoken aloud. Once the plan was put into effect, the force invaded Cuba, they were routed, they were imprisoned, and it was an utter humiliation, embarrassment, and fiasco for the Kennedy administration. The day after the Bay of Pigs, JFK said, how could I have been so stupid? And the answer is, they let him. They wanted it to be true. They suppressed all their doubts. They censored themselves. They did all the things that would make the operative belief seem like the truth, masquerade as truth. I hear you saying that nations practice self-deception just as families do. The model is the family. The collective mind has its own blind spots. The collective mind works com in a completely parallel way to the individual mind. The public mind. The public mind. The shared reality that we create in that public mind is as susceptible to self-deception as we are individually. It's sort of the sum total of the things we won't look at. But why won't we look at them? Publicly, the, collectively? For the exact same reason. And they're, they're too anxiety-provoking, they're too painful. Failure to look at the fearsome truth and the unwillingness to acknowledge the facts 
have been costly to our country. We've paid that cost in human life and mutual trust. Decisive moments in our recent past, unforgettable moments, reveal those pressures that drive people to deny the truth and distort reality. In 1986, the nation mourned the death of seven astronauts who died aboard the space shuttle Challenger. Most Americans refer to Challenger as a tragic accident. I can't characterize it as an accident at all. It's a disaster, a horrible, terrible disaster, but not an accident. Because we could have stopped it, we had initially stopped it, and then that decision was made to go forward anyways. Roger Beaujolais was an engineer at Morton Fire Call, the company that makes the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle. He was convinced that the booster design contained a major flaw. For years, the O-rings that act as seals between booster segments were eroding in cold weather. And I was definitely afraid that we were going to experience a catastrophe and that everybody was just going to brush this whole thing aside and, and no one would be accountable because everybody would say, well, we didn't know it was that serious. Well, I erased that. Uh, condition by writing a very pointed memo and predicting that we were going to have loss of human life and catastrophe if we continued to do nothing about it. Beaujolais sent the memo to his boss. It was stamped company private and never reached NASA. Six months later, Challenger was rolled into place and the seven astronauts made their final preparations for liftoff. There was one more chance to avoid disaster. The day before launch, Morton Fire Call engineers learned that weather reports were calling for freezing temperatures overnight. We immediately went to the engineering management at Morton Fire Call and spent that afternoon convincing engineering management not to launch under such adverse conditions. And they, and they accepted those arguments and presentations. Other Morton Fire Call engineers also argued against launch. And uh, my recommendation in some of the former meetings was just merely to wait a day. I made the direct statement that if anything happened to this launch, uh, I told him I sure wouldn't want to be the person that had to stand in front of a board of inquiry. There was no doubt in my mind that we weren't going to launch. But NASA had other ideas. The space agency was under pressure to launch, pressure created by years of exaggerated expectations. In the 1960s, NASA was responsible for one of the great achievements of human history. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. But then NASA faced a dilemma. What to do next? Their answer was the shuttle. The reusable space shuttle vehicles are designed to fly up to 60 missions a year. They will be launched like a rocket and land like an airplane. The shuttle program was almost made up out of the whole cloth. There is nothing in its original specifications that has come anywhere near reality and performance. Robert Holtz was editor-in-chief of Aviation Week and Space Technology and a member of the Presidential Commission that investigated the Challenger disaster. They had the illusion that the uh, shuttle would be a, a space airliner, a, a cargo truck with a regularity and economy that uh, time has proved was a, a grand illusion. A belief is simply a self-confirming theory. If you have a belief, what happens is you ignore any evidence that disputes it, and you remember and you exaggerate everything that supports it. We do it all the time. In some ways it's very helpful, and in many ways it's destructive. The belief had taken on a life of its own. Pressures to fulfill it were evident the night before the launch of Challenger. During a conference call between Morton Firecall and NASA, Firecall, acting on the advice of Beaujolais and his colleagues, recommended the launch be postponed because of the cold weather. When that came over the phone to the gentleman that was asking the questions from the Kennedy Space Center, he just was beside himself. And he made a few terse comments and then asked his man, who was essentially chief engineer at NASA, for his launch decision. And his name was George Hardy. And he responded that he was appalled by Thiokol's recommendation. Wharton Thiokol had pressures of its own. The company was the only supplier of booster rockets and NASA was its biggest customer. But just one week before the Challenger launch, NASA announced it was looking for a second source and had invited four companies to bid on the project. Which was worth in excess of $1 billion. 
Now, the significance is not only the money significance, but the fact that they were the sole source. They were the only company without competition that was making those motors. And to not accommodate a major customer like NASA may have put that type of situation in jeopardy. Now, in that fateful conference call, the NASA managers were telling Morton Firecall they did not want to delay the launch. The pressure was on the company to reverse its recommendation. I didn't have to make a decision, but I felt the pressure. I know our managers felt the pressure. Because if they hadn't felt the pressure, why would they have asked the following question? Which was, we request a five-minute caucus, which is a five-minute meeting amongst ourselves when they put the telephone conversation on hold, essentially. Beaujolais later testified what happened during that meeting. Gerald Mason was the senior fire call manager present. Robert Lund was the top-ranking fire call engineer. Mr. Mason said, we have to make a management decision. He turned to Bob Lund and asked him to take off his engineering hat and put on his management hat. I was never asked nor polled, and it was clearly a management decision from that point. Four top executives in that division basically convened their own meeting in front of us, but without our participation. And it became very obvious that they were seeking some information to put on a piece of paper that would justify a decision to launch. With no further input from the engineers, five call managers made a list of reasons in favor of launching and faxed it to NASA. That was almost immediately accepted by NASA without any probing questions or discussion because they had received now the answer that they had hoped that it, they would receive from the beginning, and that was a decision to launch. The third ranking member of NASA's launch chain of command participated in the conference call and heard the warnings. Those warnings went no higher. For better or worse, I did not perceive any clear requirement for interaction with level two. Meanwhile, NASA is trying to convince Congress that it can do about 25 missions a year. It's under real pressure to establish itself as being able to meet its dates for launch. So what happens to that message, that word of truth? It gets buried. It never goes up the line of command. So the countdown to liftoff continued. That night, the temperature was below freezing. By the time Challenger lifted off at 11.30 the next morning, it was still only 36 degrees. Pilot Mike Smith, followed by Krista McAuliffe, teacher in space. The seven astronauts had heard nothing about the possible effects of the cold. Big smiles today. Confidently getting into the van. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. Now we all thought that it was going to blow off in the pad. It was going to blow up right when they ignited the motor. Two, one, and lift on. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. So when it ignited and cleared the launch tower, we thought we we're home free. In fact, I made a statement. We just dodged a bullet. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. About 60 seconds later, into the launch, uh, my colleague sitting behind me, Bob Ebling, whispered in my ear that he just completed a prayer thanks to the Lord for a successful launch. After the explosion, what had been self-deception turned into something else, a refusal to admit what really happened. NASA tried very diligently to make it sound like an accident. We were told by Morton Thiokol attorneys to answer all questions put to us, either yes or no and volunteer nothing. Can you imagine how much information they would have found out if we had done that? NASA doesn't like to admit it was wrong, and they tried as long and as hard as possible to stick with that erroneous accident. They were reluctant to admit what really happened. Some NASA people are still reluctant to admit what happened. During the hearings, some managers from NASA and Morton Firecall tried to portray the Challenger disaster as too technical for the commission to understand. They invent acronyms for everything, and you really need a code book to understand what they're talking about. And this, again, is a form of deception. That local ambient temperature will be uh, in a tank condition. It will be below the general ambient because of the effects of the cryogens in the external tank and the heat short that exists 
through the attachments uh, uh, to the SRV and the wind uh, blowing the cold air around the SRV. NASA denied that cold weather caused the disaster until Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman performed a simple experiment. Well, I took this stuff that I got out of your seal and I put it in ice water. And I discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it maintains, it doesn't stretch back, it stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. Now